Hey there, I'm two detectives. It's Caroline Mitchell here. I'm an ex-police detective and crime thriller author. Do you know those old horror movies about an intruder in a balaclava who breaks into a young girl's home and terrorizes her family? Welcome to the strange and chilling case of Jamie Kloss, the girl under the bed. This is part of my creepy crime month and the run up to Halloween, so be prepared for a chilling case that will play on your mind. This story begins on October the 15th in 2018 in a place called Barron in Wisconsin. And I'm so sorry, Wisconsin, as I featured you in last week's true crime episode, I promise to give you a break next time. Active members of the church, the Kloss family consisted of 56 year old James Kloss, 46 year old Denise Kloss and 13 year old Jamie Kloss, their daughter. James was described as a hard working man who worked long hours to provide for his family who meant the world to him. Denise was devoted to her daughter and described as a caring person who would drop everything to help her friends. Jamie was said to be a quiet and loving girl who enjoyed skating, dancing and volleyball. But that was all about to change on the 9th of the 15th of October, just two weeks before Halloween. It was gone midnight when Jamie was woken up by Molly, her dog. Peeping out through her bedroom window, Jamie saw a car coasting onto their driveway with the engine and lights switched off. Then she made out the shape of a man dressed in head to toe in black, heading straight for their front door. Jamie ran to her parents' bedroom and woke them both up. They instantly knew something was very wrong. This stranger was dressed in a black mask, jeans, a black jacket and gloves, and was carrying a pump action shotgun. So when James saw the man holding the gun, he told his wife and daughter to barricade themselves into the bathroom while he challenged the man at the door. That's bravery right there. Protecting his family while putting himself at the front line. Denise ran to the bathroom with Jamie and barricaded the door shut with a drawer from a closet. She then huddled in the bath with her daughter, pulling the shower curtain across to hide them both. Meanwhile, James was trying to see outside by holding a torch to their living room window, but the man continued to approach and came to their front door. There was glass in the door so the man could see James through it when he stood there and yelled at him not to move. And then he yelled at him to get to the ground. James stayed where he was and the man screamed at him to open the effing door. James asked the intruder to identify himself, but instead the intruder pulled his trigger and shot James in his head through the door. It was a deafening blast. He then pumped another round and shot at the lock so he could force his way inside. Denise and her daughter were terrified and too scared to speak to the police dispatcher on the other end of the phone line. They had heard two loud shots, so by then they presumed that James was dead. Perhaps they thought it was a burglary and he would take what he wanted and leave. But as the intruder's footsteps got louder, it soon became apparent that he was coming for them. He stopped outside the bathroom door broke through the barricade and pulled the shower curtain across. This guy was unstoppable. He was on a mission and he was armed. Denise held her daughter protectively in a bear hug and the intruder shouted at her to hang up the phone. He then threw her some tape and instructed her to place it across her daughter's mouth. But Denise was shaking and upset and he snatched the tape from her hand, wrapping it around Jamie's head. Then he hosted Jamie out of the bath and threw her onto the floor next to him and without hesitation he shot Jamie's mother in the head. This was a brutal, heartless killer whose sole aim was to get what he wanted and that was Jamie Kloss. He bound Jamie's wrists and ankles, almost slipping in her father's blood as he dragged her past his body and outside to his waiting car. The man told Jamie to walk to his car before realising she was incapable of doing so because her ankles were bound. She was shoved in the boot of the car before the intruder locked it and drove off. Police were at the home in just minutes, apparently about 20 seconds after the intruder left. Indeed, the intruder actually pulled over to allow them to go past. They even made note of the car as they passed. But remember, they didn't know what they were going to. All they'd received was a muffled phone call. They weren't to know what had just happened. And from the confines of the trunk, 
Jamie heard the sirens as she lay bound and gagged. How horrific that must have been after seeing her parents murdered in cold blood. Help was so close, but not close enough. And this was in the space of just four minutes. That's the length the intruder was in the home. After over an hour of driving, the killer let Jamie out of the boot of the car and brought her into his house. He told her to sit in the hall while he caught his breath. Then he removed the tape and brought her to his basement bedroom and told her to undress so he could dispose of her clothes. He then threw her a pair of old pyjamas belonging to his sister. We don't know for sure if she was sexually assaulted. He was at home almost all of the time and when he went out he'd make her hide under his bed, then put weighted laundry baskets and tote bags all around the bed as a barricade so he'd know if she tried to escape. The space under the bed was about two and a half feet high. Can you imagine how claustrophobic that must have been? So who was this killer and why did he take Jamie Kloss? When I first heard about this case, I imagined this killer as a tall, hulking monster who had done this sort of thing before. Someone who had lived a disturbing life who had assaulted girls previously, someone who was a known offender, maybe even spent some time in jail. But in fact, the person responsible was none of these things. He was Jake Patterson, a pale, skinny, 21-year-old Wisconsin man with no previous history with police. His parents were Deborah and Patrick, who divorced when he was 12 years old. Patterson had an older brother called Eric, who was 25, and a sister, Katie, who was 27. He lived in his father's cabin in Gordon. His father was living elsewhere when this occurred. Patterson was said to have had one girlfriend who he met in Northwood High School. The girl was described as shy and geeky, but apparently she couldn't put up with his mood, so she finished with him. He was so enraged by this that he was said to have slashed the tires of her mother's car. But he was also described as having friends, although in his high school photo you can see his classmates smiling and posing while he sits down at his desk and reads. One of his old school friends said that there was no red flags and Patterson was a normal student who loved his family and his dog, Rosie. Just like anyone else he said you could joke with him. He was a human being. Perhaps that's what makes this so disturbing. Patterson was on the school quiz bowl team, but wasn't keen on sports after breaking his arm in a school wrestling game. And he lost touch with all his friends when he left school. So what made this 21 year old man take a shotgun and slaughter a mother and father in cold blood? Well, according to news reports, Patterson had a tough time growing up. His parents' marriage was not a happy one and they divorced when he was 12. It said he went bald at a young age and after school he couldn't hold down a job for very long. He stated in his high school yearbook that he wanted to join the Marines but he was discharged after just five weeks because he did not meet their expectations and standards. But that's called life. <laughs> Lots of kids face challenges growing up. They don't all turn out to be killers. So what else could it have been? Revenge? A vendetta against the family? Well, Patterson got a job at the same turkey factory where Jamie's parents had worked for years, but he only lasted one day and apparently didn't know James and Denise. Then he got a part-time job at a cheese factory where he lasted just two days, but it was on his way to work that he first laid eyes on Jamie Kloss. He saw her getting the school bus and it was a chance sighting and strangely his mum drove school buses for a living. But on that day he took one look at Jamie and decided that he had to have her. A plan grew in his mind as he plotted her kidnapping in depth and he decided to kill anyone who got in his way. He obtained stolen license plates for his sister's Ford Torres in case he was seen he visited Jamie's home twice previously but gave up on both occasions. The first time because there was too many cars on the drive and the second because the lights were on and the family were awake. He wanted to take them by surprise when they were defenceless because this wasn't some kind of sadistic killer. This was a coward who hid behind a gun. So why did he go after Jamie if it wasn't a vendetta? 
There was no previous evidence of any online interactions between them. He didn't even know her name. Well, according to the Sun newspaper, Patterson said he slept in the same bed as the 13 year old for three months, but felt too guilty to rape her. But perhaps that had been the end game all along. He's apparently said that he had sexual thoughts, but didn't act on them due to his guilt over the murders. But he didn't feel that guilty because he treated Jamie worse than a dog. He put her through hell as he murdered her parents in cold blood. Then he left her for up to 12 hours without food, water or use of a toilet when he went out, warning her that bad things would happen if she had disobeyed his instructions. He was unemployed so he could be at home every day. But his father visited regularly and Patterson would leave the radio on in his bedroom so his dad wouldn't hear Jamie moving about. Now Jamie knew he could carry out his threats. Even if she moved one of the weighted laundry bins which barricaded the bed, he would know about it and he would go crazy, shouting and hitting her. And don't forget, Jamie was scared for her life. She was just a child. He said he learned of her name from news reports, which he wouldn't let her watch on the occasions that he would allow, allow her to roam around the cabin. He said he made a lot of preparation to keep from leaving DNA evidence behind. He shaved his head, he disabled his car's dome light and fixed the trunk of his car so it couldn't be opened from the inside. He even bought a ski mask and dressed head to toe in black using a well-known brand of rifle so the police couldn't trace it back to him. He kept three extra gun cartridges for the police should they follow him. This was a cold-hearted, premeditated attack. Patterson said he was determined to take Jamie that night and he was going to kill anyone in the house who got in his way because he was determined not to leave any eyewitnesses behind. The local community was shocked and grief stricken by events, but after 88 days, Manny must have thought they would never see Jamie again. Jamie's family launched desperate appeals to find her and harrowing press conferences followed. Jamie's aunt, Jennifer Nayberg, said at the time, Jamie, we need you here with us to fill the hole that we have in our hearts. According to the Mirror newspaper, despite keeping Jamie locked up in the basement, Patterson threw his family a Christmas party in the cabin. He also tried to create a relationship with his victim. In a letter to a friend, he said how they would cook together, making his favorite Mexican food. Then on January the 20th, Jamie saw her chance to escape and took it when Patterson left her in the house alone. She managed to free herself from her prison under the bed and threw on Patterson's jeans, New Balance shoes and one of his old shirts as she fled the cabin. She dressed in such a hurry his oversized shoes had been on the wrong feet. And she was underdressed for the freezing temperatures but her only thought was that of escape. Thankfully, retired social worker and trauma counsellor Jenny Nutter was out walking her dog when she heard Jamie crying for help. She said, I had my dog with me. We started walking and I'm getting towards my driveway and I hear someone calling, I need help, I'm lost, I don't know where I am. As she got closer to me, we actually touched. She said, I'm Jamie and I looked at her and I said, I know. Jenny took Jamie to a house further up to keep some distance between Jamie and her kidnapper. Jamie was described as being skinny and dirty, but outwardly okay by the couple who called the emergency services. Despite everything she had been through, Jamie still managed to give police an accurate description of Patterson's car, and he was arrested about five minutes away. Patterson was actually out looking for Jamie when the police caught up with him. As soon as officers approached his car, he said, I know why you want to talk to me, and I did it. Like many killers, he appears to enjoy the press attention and apparently wrote a letter in response to communication from a news channel who had asked him questions about the case. He replied, I can't believe I did this, and that he would plead guilty so Jamie and her relatives didn't have to worry about a trial. Yet this is a man who killed her parents without a moment's hesitation. He could have tied them up. He could have injured them to slow them down, but instead he chose to murder them at point blank range as they desperately tried to protect their child. As for why he kidnapped Jamie, he said, it's not black and white. 
He wouldn't say what his long-term plans were at the time, but claimed they were really stupid looking back. He said the police claimed that his actions were well planned, but he denied that, saying it was mostly an impulse and that he didn't think like a serial killer did. Really? It sounds pretty cold and calculated to me. When asked what was going through his mind, he said at the time that he was really pissed. Didn't want to do it, but it was complicated. When I was in the police, I interviewed a lot of offenders and I found that they were comfortable talking about things in the run up to the event or afterwards. But when you try to pin them down to the incident itself, many perpetrators couldn't or wouldn't explain their motives. I believe the truth is that they know full well why they did these things, as Patterson did. They did it for their own evil gain, and they didn't care in the slightest who they hurt along the way. But they knew that by saying this, it would make them look bad. So it was easier to say they didn't remember, or things like, it's complicated. After signing off his letter, Patterson expressed his remorse, writing in bubble letters, I'm sorry, Jamie, for everything. Even in court, he mouthed the words, goodbye, Jamie, as he left. I think he had some warped feelings towards Jamie, but didn't know what love was. Only that he wanted someone to love him, serve him, but he would give nothing but pain in return. There's some clues of his intentions in a letter he wrote from his jail cell. The judge read out this letter in court and all the while Patterson was shaking his head. I started having bad thoughts all the time, the letter reads. Fantasies about keeping a young girl prisoner, torturing her and controlling her. Before I did this, I planned on taking multiple girls, killing multiple families. When Inside Edition news journalists visited Patterson's home, they found empty packaging for a packet of ladies' diapers and various books, including a US Armed Forces Survival Guide. Strangely, while Jamie was missing, a man by the name of Kyle Jenk Annis, aged 23, broke into Jamie's home and was caught stealing her clothes and underwear. When questioned, he said he was curious as to what size she was. Hmm, right. He was cleared of suspicion with regards to Jamie's kidnapping and pleaded guilty to misdemeanor theft and was sentenced to two years of probation. He was not believed to have been involved in her kidnapping, although it does raise questions. And I've seen his interviews and he does come across as a very strange man. The Daily Mail has since reported that Patterson's mother prays for her son's salvation daily and regards the moment that she learned of his guilt as a sort of death. Following Patterson's arrest, she told officers that her divorce from Patrick had messed up her kids and that she felt really guilty because of it. She said she was aware of the Kloss case and prayed for Jamie's safe return. She said that Patterson's father, Patrick, was very upset and wanted everyone to know that he was sorry and couldn't understand how this happened. He told officers that he never went into his son's room, save once in December when he went in to turn down the radio. He registered nothing other than the fact that the room was trashed. I mean, can you imagine that poor girl lying under that bed, hearing footsteps coming in and wondering if she should hold her breath and stay quiet? or scream for help. It must have been awful. I mean, he did warn her that if she told anyone where she was, he would kill her. And she knew he had a shotgun with, you know, loaded basically in the house. So it's, it's just a horrible thought. Patterson was described by the judge during his sentencing as the embodiment of evil after pleading guilty to abducting Jamie and killing her parents on October the 15th. He was jailed for life. A $50,000 reward was put up for Jamie's recovery. Half had been put up by the Jenny O Turkey Factory, where her parents worked, and the other half by law enforcement. The neighbouring couple who called the police were offered the reward, but chose to give it to Jamie as she had saved herself. That's heartwarming, isn't it? Meanwhile, Jamie is back with the surviving members of her family and being brought up by her relatives. She's rebuilding her life in the arms of her local community. 
There are some things that Patterson can never take from me, she said. He can't take my freedom. He thought he could own me. He was wrong. I was smarter. I watched his routine and I took back my freedom. I will always have my freedom and he will not. What an amazing young woman, just 13 years old. It's very disturbing to think that such things can happen in a small town like Barron with no prior warning or apparent motivation. But she's such a brave girl and she did save herself. Who knows how this could have ended and it's possible Patterson could have went on to kill again. Have you heard about this case? What do you think of Patterson? And why do you think he took Jamie? If you found this video of interest, I'd hugely appreciate a like. If you know of anyone else who's addicted to true crime, please let them know about my channel. Every share and subscription really helps. I hope to see you again soon. And remember, these crimes are rare, so don't let them keep you awake at night. I hope you've enjoyed this latest in my creepy crime Halloween series. And I have two more to come, so don't miss out. Until next time, bye bye.